Time of Grace with Mark Jeske is made possible by the financial support of the Time of Grace viewers and partners in this area. You might think that the primary way that Time of Grace comes to people is through broadcast television, and you'd be right. But new opportunities in technology are arising all the time, none more powerful than mobile telephones called smartphones when they have video capability and on those screens you can receive time of grace video not just here in our country but really all over the world what makes this story of this new technology so compelling is that there are countries that actually screen and restrict what types of television broadcasts can be made but we can bring Time of Grace's messages in all kinds of places in, around, and under these types of censorship on people's mobile devices. It's my great pleasure to announce the launching of Time of Grace's Operation Smart Reach. What this will do is we will purchase the technology that we need to distribute Time of Grace's television programs and video all over the world and to get to people's mobile devices, not just here in America, but worldwide. Did you know that there are two times as many mobile phones in the world already as televisions? And I'm sure that number is only going to increase. We have received the thrilling news that we have already a $60,000 matching challenge from some donors who really want this to succeed. And what that means is I'd like to invite you to become part of this effort. And it means that if the Lord has blessed you and enabled you to give a gift of $100, the matching gift will double its impact to $200. Or perhaps the Lord has inspired and blessed you to give $50 or whatever amount is in your heart, it will be doubled by this matching gift. I hope you'll join me in this amazing effort so that Time of Grace can bring good news of Jesus Christ while there's time to people not just here in America, but literally all over the world through Operation Smart Reach. Please join me and pray for the success of this project today. Do you know any people who homeschool their children? So tell me, do you know people who homeschool their children? I guess I didn't used to think there were all that many homeschool kids in America, but I keep running into them. People will tell me, yeah, I was homeschooled. Or I run into parents, uh, people my age or a little younger, who say, yeah, we homeschool our kids. In America, if you look around a little bit, you can find some estimates that over a million children a year are being homeschooled in the United States. It seems that countries that have a tradition of trusting their citizens will also trust them to homeschool their children. In totalitarian countries which thrive on total control, they use public schooling and mandatory public schooling as an instrument of state um, inculcation of their values and kind of like propaganda. But in the countries that come from Great Britain, which were its former colonies like Canada, South Africa, and the United States, you will find really a huge homeschool movement. South Africa, believe it or not, has a huge homeschool movement. And I'd like to think with you a little bit about the value of homeschooling. schools. In fact, all ways of discipling children are important and valuable, and this day we celebrate the fact that not only does our God care for children, but He invites us and even challenges, even commands us to care as much as He does. Today is the beginning of a new message series that I'll be bringing you as we dig into the book of Deuteronomy today. And I'm calling it, He Cares, We Care. And number one is about the little ones, about children. Would you open up your Bible with me to Deuteronomy chapter 4? And I'd like to read to you and savor with you and dig into one paragraph from the farewell address of a man who knew he was dying. Not dying of disease, dying because God had said, your funeral is going to be in about two weeks. I don't 
as far as we can tell from the way the Bible describes Moses' life, he was vigorous and healthy, and he go, 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 dead. And it wasn't that he had a heart attack or stroke. God just had decided, this is the last day of your life. Now you're coming home with me. How old was Moses when he died? Who knows? Oh, wait. Nobody knows. Aren't you glad you came today? He was 120. Wow. And he didn't grow feeble. He didn't geezer in like, uh, like I'm already halfway there. He didn't, he didn't so like slowly, you know, just kind of coast in. He was vigorous till the last. Moses was 120, and his life was marked, was cut in three pieces by two violent interventions. And, you know, it, it's just kind of crazy. God has this thing about the number 40. I, I have to talk to him when we get to heaven. One of my curious things, what is it with the number 40? But if you look up in a Bible concordance, the word 40, it pops up in, in about 20 or 30 different Bible stories. Like, what is the deal with 40? I think, if I may dare to put uh, words in God's mouth for him, this is just a hypothesis that God thought of that as one life cycle, like a generation. And he picked a round number and he used it over and over again. Like Jonah, uh, how many days did the people of Nineveh had to repent? Forty. Moses' life, 120, was divided into three segments, self-contained segments of 40 years. Segment one, act one, pampered, spoiled, highly educated, brought up in the royal court of the Egyptians, adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, grew up the easy life. Moses was living the dream. But then he decided unilaterally to start the revolution, and he killed an Egyptian and had to flee. Act two, poverty-stricken shepherd boy scrounging for an existence, needing an adoptive family just to survive. Criminal on the lamb, murderer with a price on his head and had to flee uh, to the east and hide out in the desert and basically take up the life of a nomadic shepherd. Act three, God finds him when he's ready. God made him wait till he was 80 before he was useful. And God said, now I think I can use you. I think those 40 years in the desert have prepped you for what I need you for. And he was the leader of the people of Israel in the great exodus. And then back in the desert he goes. He must have had skin like leather. For 40 years, because of the hardness of their hearts, the people of Israel either stalled when God said sit, they sat and, the, and camped out, sent them manna. Obviously, without the manna, they would have never survived in the Sinai Desert. It's a waterless, treeless, foodless place. Um, you could barely survive, but... Uh, two or three or four million people, no way could they have survived unless God simply dropped food out of heaven, which he did for four decades. Now God had told Moses, I have good news and bad news. Which do you want first? And Moses said, well, you better give me the bad news first. And God said, because of the way you blew me off when I had an important message and you disrespected me and contradicted me and disobeyed me, you are not going to walk into the land of Canaan. And Moses said, well, what's the good news? And God said, you have two pieces of good news. I'm going to let you see it from Mount Nebo. And the second piece of good news is soon you'll be in heaven and you won't care. <laughs> but Moses thought, oh, <laughs> didn't know I was sick. Or I didn't, didn't know I was elderly, I guess. Anyway, at God's prompting, he had to unload some instruction for these people because they were capable at any time of unraveling spiritually. They're always at risk. And remember this, the entire generation of adult Israelites had died off in the desert because of that contempt that they showed to the word of the Lord. God said, okay, you love, you don't want the promised land I'm going to give you? All right, you don't have to have it. I'll give it to your children instead. Do you know that every adult Everybody over the age of 20 died in the desert and God waited till they were all gone before he allowed them to move on. Deuteronomy, Moses' farewell, four big farewell speeches were spoken to a very young audience. The oldest was 40. Average age would have been about 20. These, half of these were kids. 
Grade school kids and teenagers sitting there listening. Now, obviously, all two or three million of them couldn't have heard Moses' voice without electronic amplification. So he must have had an inner ring that could hear his voice, and then the Levites were writing all this stuff down frantically to keep up, and then they would reteach it. And so it worked its way through the nation. I'm sure, this is how I think it happened, through the priests and Levites to get everybody. But this is what Moses needed them to know. They were too young to have remembered slavery from personal experience. They were only tales from their parents and grandparents. They did not witness the drowning of the Egyptians in the Red Sea. But I'll tell you what they had experienced. This wandering nation had survived not one, two, three, not four, not five, not six, but at least seven military assaults. These ex-slaves had somehow managed to arm themselves and to fight full-tilt military battles of assaults that they had received, of people who would not let them pass. They never initiated them. They were attacked. Seven victories. So they had already begun to see the arm of the Lord at work. Very soon they were going to cross the Jordan River on dry land, and these people were going to see the walls of Jericho fall over in front of trumpet blasts from the Lord. But Moses was very nervous about their understanding. And he had, uh, this is called the, the book of Deuteronomy. It has, it's crazy. I don't, I don't it's, it's a little hazy to me how on earth this name, it's a Greek word. Or it's two, actually two Greek words. Deutero means second and nomos means law. It's not even a good nickname, the second law, because it's nothing new. Moses is basically reteaching the covenant to people who were too young to have gotten it the first time. And in Hebrew, it, this book begins, these are the words that Moses spoke. So that's the nickname of this book in the, in the Hebrew Bible. It's just called the words, Moses' words. So I'd like to just look at a few on this special education Sunday, uh, the Christian Education Sunday, at a paragraph in chapter 4. Chapter 4 begins, Hear now, O Israel, the decrees and laws I am about to teach you. Why? Follow them so that you may live. In other words, this is not just a little cultural transmission, like I'm going to teach you um, how we Israelites uh, care for animals, or I'm going to teach you some of our songs, or I'm going to pass on some of our national history and trivia and things like that, or help you know some of, some of the recipes for our favorite national dishes. This is life or death. What you do with the open arms of the Lord your God will determine how happy a life you have on this earth and will determine what becomes of you in the great judgment. This is urgent business. Listen, hear Israel. Now, slide your eyes. There's, there's a whole lot of this stuff. You'd, you'll enjoy reading Deuteronomy. It's very clear. It's, it's not hard going at all. It's, it's fascinating reading. Let's just pick up one paragraph and slide down to verse 9. Be careful. Watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen, those seven military victories that God had given, or let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Satan, your enemy, will try to steal your confidence, your covenant, your relationship with your God from you. Don't let them resist. Take inventory of your treasures and make your relationship with God your number one. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. I commission all of you to become homeschoolers. Your children may never pick this up on their own. You must make it your business to transmit your faith. Now, you cannot believe for your children, but you can tell them the truth. You cannot turn them from unbelievers into believers. God only can do that, but you can tell them the truth. You cannot guarantee how their lives will turn out, but you can set them up for success by telling them things that they do not know by nature. 
And he, he reminds them now of the time at Mount Sinai when God had gathered the nation around. These kids were, by now, uh, could not remember that. Um, so he had to kind of retell them. Remember the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, that's another word for Mount Sinai, where the Ten Commandments were given, when he said to me, assemble the people before me to hear my words so that they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land may teach them to their children. There's that transmission thing again. You came near and stood at the foot of the mountain while it blazed with fire to the very heavens, with black clouds and deep darkness. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sound of words but saw no form. There was only a voice. He declared to you His covenant, the Ten Commandments. They're a summary of it. Uh, that wasn't, of course, the totality of it. That, that was just the executive summary, which he commanded you to follow and then wrote them on two stone tablets. As far as I can tell, that was the first instance in human history of the words of God written down. Before that, transmission of God's word was oral. Now the great age of writing of God's words had begun, and God did it himself, autographing his ten words for them on two flat pieces of stone. The Lord directed me at that time to teach you the decrees and laws you are to follow. It was a terrifying event. I am glad I was not there. You probably should be glad you weren't there. You might think, how cool, it would have been fun to see Moses come down with the Ten Commandments. You wouldn't have enjoyed the experience. The earth shook even worse than the earthquake that shook America this last summer. Trumpets blasted so loud the people clapped their hands over their ears. When they heard God speak, it was not the soothing voice of their daddy. It was the powerful, majestic, booming voice of the creator of the universe who holds all things accountable to his will. They clapped their hands over their ears and said, make him stop. We can't bear it any longer. Thick black clouds rolled around. This was not um, the hills are alive with the sound of music. This was, oh God, we're going to die. And God had several things to impress upon them. Number one, you are sinful and by the way you're born, you're cut off from me and some bridging has to happen and you are incapable of doing it yourself. If you step close to me, what would happen to people who stepped on the holy mountain at that point? Do you know your Bible stories? They would I will come to you. You cannot come to me. But he then followed to lay out the sacrificial system by which an innocent victim could be slain and the individual believer be forgiven of his or her guilt and could approach God. But the second message at Sinai that is sometimes overlooked is the prologue. And here's what God said. Uh, when Moses was called up to the mountain, he was allowed to step on it and not be killed. This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob. This is from Exodus 19. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt on your behalf. I set the slaves free because I love you. You've seen what I did to Egypt, how I carried you on eagles' wings. It's as though I was a giant bird and I took you on my back and I took you out of the burning um, sulfurous ruin and I carried you to a safe place because I love you. Out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Israel, you have value to me. You're precious. You're expensive. You're worth pursuing. I want you in my family. I love you. That's part of Sinai's message as well. And the reason Moses is going on and on like this, why he keeps saying, tell your children, is the only thing people know about God by birth is what's placed in their being, in their conscience. And all your conscience tells you is a vague sense of the rules. You feel generally good about yourself if you think you're being good, and when you do what is wrong, you can't stop a feeling of guilt coming over you. Your conscience makes you nervous. 
And we have all kinds of human man-made ways to get rid of a guilty conscience, but only one thing works to take away that guilt permanently, and that's the gospel of our Savior's forgiveness. Set up as a demo by the dying animals, the bulls and the sheep and goats of the sacrificial system, and all their blood was splattered in anticipation of the one-time Lamb of God on His once-for-all cross, when the once-for-all, it is finished, was pronounced. And the once-for-all message of God, I forgive you for my son's sake. But nobody knows about the gospel by birth, by instinct, by conscience. Your conscience says nothing about God's rescue plan. It must be revealed to us by God, and it must be communicated by people who know to people who don't know. It must be handed off. It must be shared. This is true of us sideways, that you and I have a great mission imperative to share the gospel sideways. But today, I challenge you, I command you, I exhort you, I beg of you, I call upon you to join with me in doing what Moses invites and challenges us, to rededicate ourselves, to make sure that the young ones coming up have heard the gospel. For if we don't tell them, who will? Satan will fill the heads of our youth with nonsense, suicidal nonsense, unless we reveal to them what God has revealed to us. There isn't a man or woman in this room who would put up with allowing children to fend for themselves in life without ever having to take reading classes and decipher writing. That's child abuse. We would never allow it. You're unemployable if you can't read. We would not allow anybody to any home educator or school educator to allow children to drift through their education without learning how to manage numbers. If you cannot manage numbers, you're unemployable. You, You cannot function in this world, especially now, where there are no more decent paying jobs for unskilled labor. A strong back does not get you squat anymore, does it? If you do not know how to manage words and numbers, you can't do anything for our society. That's a given, right? Then why are so many parents contemptuous and neglectful of connecting the gospel that they've heard to their children? And this day, to all of you, not just to the some of you who homeschool children in the full range, but every one of you with a child, with a niece, a nephew, a grandchild. May you all be homeschoolers so that your children not only know about the anger and judgment of God, the gloom and thunderclaps and earthquakes on Mount Sinai, but they also know of an aching, compassionate love from a father who has rescued his people in the past and has performed the ultimate rescue on Calvary so that he can put them up on his eagle's wings and carry them from this dying world to a place of life. You and I are bearers of life. And the same thing that Moses challenged his hearers back then, I now put before you death and life. Choose life. Follow the covenant of the Lord so that you may live. And I invite you to join with me in a commitment to invest time, energy, prayer, and your money and your advocacy for all efforts which seek to communicate the gospel, a saving gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, His love and forgiveness to children. And if you are willing to invest of yourself in that holy mission with me, then say, I am. I'm thrilled to have the chance to talk to you today and share good news from God's Word about how much our Savior loves us and especially how much our Savior Jesus loves children. I also love having you as my partners through your support for Time of Grace on a regular basis. I consider you to be my partners in ministry. If you have never made a contribution to Time of Grace's ministry, let me ask you today to pray and consider today, right now, 
to become one of my partners on an ongoing basis and help us share the wonderful message of what Jesus did for all people, especially for children. I've got some great news. My new book is out. It's called Straight Talk, Answers from God's Word. And what it is, is it's a series of questions that viewers and readers have sent to us and asked me about, compelling me to dig into God's Word and provide answers. I think you might really be interested in seeing what was on people's minds. I think they're probably asking questions you'd like to know as well. If you'd like your own copy of Straight Talk, Answers from God's Word, go to our website. It's on your screen right now. Or call us. That phone number is on our screen right now as well. I'd also like you to know that if you are interested in receiving short bits of information through Twitter, 144 characters or less, you can find us at twitter.com slash TOG ministry. That's for all you social media fans. I'd like to pray with you today as our, our program concludes. Let's pray to our Lord about children. Lord Jesus, what a thrill it is to see how much you care about children. They need you too. They're little sinners, and they need what you have purchased at great cost for them. Help us to help our children who are also your children. You did not want people to keep them away from you or to hinder them. He said, you said to us, let the little children come to me. And we want to do that with your help. Help us care about our children as much as you do and help us to bring them clearly in terms that they understand the greatest message in the world, that you love them now and forever, and that there is forgiveness and hope and heaven in you alone. Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. For Time of Grace, I'm Pastor Mark Jeske, reminding you that every day is a day of God's grace for you. How should I respond to people that think that living together before marriage is a good practice? Why did God create the world that he knew would fall into sin? The Bible is a goldmine of wisdom and knowledge. In Pastor Mark's new book, he answers over 100 questions people have about the Bible and the Christian life. For satisfying answers and an assurance of God's love for you, read Pastor Mark's book, Straight Talk, Answers from God's Word. Order from our website at timeofgracestore.org. Helping you reach the next level of your Christian life is a driving passion for Mark Jeske and the ministry team at Time of Grace. When you visit timeofgrace.org, you'll find more resources than ever, including video extras, social media connections, new products, plus our prayer ministry, all at timeofgrace.org. And pray about becoming a Grace Partner an exclusive group of partners and donors who are committed to help us expand Mark Jeske's teaching ministry around the world. Just call 1-800-661-3311 or visit us at timeofgrace.org. Thanks for watching and join us again next time for Mark Jeske and Time of Grace. Time of Grace with Mark Jeske has been made possible by the financial support of the Time of Grace viewers and partners in this area. Thank you.